Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to do pickums, pickums, pickums. How do we start? Let's see where we are so far. In terms of leaders, we're only on 10 points. Because we only got one right. That was BDS. We chose PSG BDS. Look at all these gangsters, man. Look at them. They chose GAM and BDS. Perfect picks. 66. Okay. It is what it is. Feels bad that I can't get the perfect one so far. But we're definitely getting in the top 5,000. That's what's up. The only issue... The only issue is that if I reveal my picks and if more than 5,000 of you pick the same ones as me, you will tackle me out. It is what it is. Crystal ball. What do we have so far? How many reverse sweeps will there be a world out of nine total BO5s? So two have already been played. One was a reverse sweep, BDS against PSG. So, of course, it, reverse sweeps are not that common. Not that common. So we are still in a fairly, fairly decent position. Fairly decent position. Even though this year has been the year of reverse sweeps. I'm going to be perfectly honest. What will be the duration of the longest single game of Worlds? I honestly... When I saw that in planes there's no Chinese team, no Korean team, I thought we're going to have some real extended banger. But this one has not hit sadly how many pentacles will there be a world boom we won this one easy peasy we already have enough locked it in and uh, which drake would be killed the most we are screwed because cloud drakes just keep spawning there's uh nothing we can do about that man they just keep spawning i took the most logical answer because hextech drakes are drakes that um everyone wants to kill so when they spawn they're not left alive uh, Cloud Drake sometimes is left alive. How many battle steals will there be at Worlds? T1 is gonna play soon, and Pioshik is gonna be playing too. Uh, so there will be stonks. There will be stonks. Poppy, we're sitting at a solid two uh, when it comes to Poppy, who will be played in the most different roles. We saw a Poppy Jungle, we also saw a Poppy Top. Uh, we're hoping for a Poppy support. Right now, Poppy is in competition with the likes of Set, Rel. Maokai as well was played in the bot lane AD carry position, which kind of scares me because Jungle Maokai already has been played, and then AD carry Maokai has been played together with Senna. So if Maokai support somehow makes an appearance, uh, we are screwed. Very screwed. Oriana, who will be picked the most during the champion select at Worlds? Uh, so this is not presence, this is just picked. Uh, we're doing fine with Oriana pick, I'd say. Zaya is definitely dominating the numbers. We'll be banned. This was, according to Plains, a bad choice. But um, I think the Tale will catch some some steam uh, coming in deeper. But if I had to choose now, if I had to choose now, I'd probably say Rumble. You know, I think Rumble will uh, be one of the most banned champions at uh, the main event. What well, are the most old desert worlds? Nautilus, yeah. No bad games played so far, so I'm hoping that someone busts out the bot and grabs some wins for me. Who played the most champs? This is, you know, all in all, all in fine, all in dandy. Let's do the picks. This is what you're here for, right? This is what you're here for. You're here for the picks. You've listened to me ramble about old content. You want new content. You want to know which eight teams are going to advance and why, right? So, my method to this will be that I'm going to put teams in a bracket of these are teams I'm going to take for granted that they're going to qualify because they should have an edge against the majority of opponents. So even in a case where they drop matches against one another, I think and believe that they are going to just qualify. So Genji is a no-brainer. Genji. This is in no particular order. This is just choose eight teams to advance. Boom. JDG is a no-brainer too. I think LNG is a no-brainer. That's for sure. I think Billy Billy as well is a no-brainer. 
it's, it's, it's going to be interesting because Chinese teams have a history of performing very poorly in B1s. And both LCK and the LPL play best of threes all the time. So this is what they are more acclimated to and adjusted to. So if there's an opportunity for the Western teams to cause an upset, it's definitely in the BO1s. Because if you win two BO1s, all of a sudden you have three chances at winning a best of three to qualify you to the main event. And this also means that you have three chances to roll a potential easy opponent to qualify you to the World Championship quarterfinals. So the BO1s are very, very crucial. Uh, I think that... Um, G2 and Fnatic, uh, the front runners for Western League of Legends, definitely need to uh, get the job done early. Uh, but then again, their matchup is LNG and Damwon, which is a very, very tough matchup. Korean teams, historically very strong in the BO1s. They hit the ground running with uh, the first big Yumi's. Um, I would put T1 in this bracket too. I, I will put T1 uh, in this guaranteed bracket too. I, I don't think that... Um, these five teams are, have enough opposition to actually lose three times. I, I can't imagine the bracket playing out in that way. It needs to follow some... It needs to be some Doctor Strange type shit scenario where you have a circumstance where these teams only face off against each other and beat each other out, right? Next in line, I guess, um, in terms of what the power ranking would be is just KT. I think KT... It's a very strong team, very solid team. I think that um, in a similar vein to Billy Billy, Billy Billy had a fantastic year all around. KT had a fantastic summer, and then they lost two quite close BO5s against T1 that ran all the way to five games. So I think KT as a team is definitely a team that is underrated. So I'm going to put KT in also the guaranteed bucket. And now the question is, right, in terms of the odds that are presented and the draw that um, uh, Europe had, um, there was this post on Reddit in regards to how um, European teams uh, or Western teams qualifying to quarters without playing a single Eastern team, uh, a single team achieving that, uh, the odds of that were high if you imagine uh, in this circumstance that every Eastern team beats out uh, the, the Western teams, right? And I include GAM in the Western team bracket, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, Vietnam. Um, but with the first initial draw, considering we have, for example, G2 versus Damwon and Fnatic uh, versus um, LNG, that already, you know, decreases the odds extensively. So I think the odds of that lucky star shot draw uh, coming to fruition uh, has been severely limited. And additionally, I think that we are forced more so than ever to actually look at the merit uh, of the teams qualifying. So, with that being said, I think that when it comes to these three, these three teams, that's where we have to choose two, right? I do believe that... Um, I do believe that G2 and Damon are going to make it through. And I think the G2, partially right because of what I've seen in solo queue from the players and uh, due to my meta assessment, uh, I think that G2 lines up very, very well. I think G2 lines up very, very well with what I believe the meta assessment is. And I think that that is going to be a big positive for G2. Right? I mentioned the priority on Poppy. I mentioned Rambo. Uh, I mentioned um, the mid lane pool. Uh, I've also mentioned the different angles you can expand yourself in, in, in bot lane. I think that this tournament for Han Sama has a much better meta than the one that we saw at MSI, for example, the last time G2 played internationally. So I think G2 is going to actually have the edge uh, over Weibo. In the end, there's a lot at play here, a lot at play here. Um, even though I mentioned circumstances where 
European teams, Western teams having like that star shot run um, is uh, less likely to happen with the first initial draw. I still, you know, there's going to be elements of freakiness here that are going to play out. I think Dam one is an exciting team. I think part of it is what I've watched from solo queue. The buzz that has been created from just the conversation surrounding Damon and things that I've heard. I uh, am excited to see both G2 and, and Damon in action. But this is going to be my pick'em. This is going to be my pick'em. It was a question of just isolating the advancing picks that I know and really believe are going to go through. And then, of course, uh, the, the the last two between Damwon, G2, and Weibo. Who do you think is going to be the one qualifying? I want to also highlight that um, this is working with the assumption that the top-end teams are going to continue in a similar form as they have throughout the year, uh, which isn't... which it's very likely that one of these six teams is going to play a lot worse than expected. That is just the element of the sport. You have five players, you have a, you have a, you have a fresh meta, and you have a, a game that is very reliant on everyone's individual form coming into a tournament. Because that can affect your practice and that's going to affect your performance. And you have to deal with a lot of random variables. You try to control them the best you can and you try to prepare yourself for any, anything, but sometimes and more often than not, a team or two or sometimes even three uh, teams tend to deconstruct. So I think that this was the most logical approach to the Bikram, but sometimes things we cannot explain, I was always saying illogical, uh, things we cannot explain without the information from inside might happen and that's what makes the world championship so exciting because one of these homies are gonna crash and burn maybe two maybe three and then maybe through those ashes teams below them rise because in the end i hope that every team that is here goes with the intention to win because Luck is where opportunity and preparation meets. Because luck is only luck if you dare to take it. Okay, that is the Swiss. That is the Swiss. I think it's good to round off with a bit of a schedule uh, breakdown. Let's do some predictions in the first initial one. And uh, give you guys some thoughts surrounding the teams. So this is going to be a very quick rundown of each team. And uh, I think that... Um, so it's a good and simple way of, of, of getting you in tune with some of the teams maybe you didn't watch. So Team Liquid Honda, uh, they made a change up in the mid lane, bringing uh, APA, uh, a very unique player uh, to the team that gave them um, a lot of life uh, because of the impact he has in the big and bam phase. So APA, uh, Ziggs, uh, and he has his Nico as well. He has his Casio. He has some niche picks that makes him dynamic and makes him pull away a lot of attention from the players that actually do the heavy lifting on this team, uh, which is Pioshik and Summit. Summit, I think, was the best laning top laner in uh, the LCS uh, by a wide margin. He limits himself to a few champions, and APA drawing bans on that front uh, was something that was very impactful. Uh, Pioshik as well, he definitely uh, did so much better in... In, in summer than in spring, he really, really took on uh, that carry role for the team. You could see it in the way Team Liquid drafted. It was often the Viegos and uh, the Kindreds and in that direction, uh, rather than what was the most current, the Maokais and uh, the tank junglers. So this was Team Liquid's identity. Uh, Summit and Pioshik doing heavy lifting and then Yonk or JJ trying to like uh, uh, include themselves in situations. Tricky thing about Yon and Code JJ, I think most of the time, in a lot of cases, they had quite mediocre performances, but I think that you saw potential from them uh, at times. So, Team Liquid, definitely a team that has practiced long in Korea, and they could find positive impact from that. 
It was this interview of um, Showmaker highlighting Ewan as a player that, uh, you know, he, he saw. And and I think it's based on the fact that Ewan is often playing solo queue and often in the games with Showmaker. So I think that he admires the work ethic there from Ewan. And, you know, players are defined by their history until they are capable of breaking through of that in a match as important as this one against T1. It's funny that Coach JJ and, of course, Yoshik have uh, taken championships away, away from T1 and Faker, of course. T1 as a team, you know, I think uh, T1, a mechanical wunderkind team. I think in terms of the mechanical ability, uh, Gumayushi and um, Zeus and Karia, I think that they are capable of competing with the best. And you know that... Uh, the players with such mechanical ability have the potential to also be the best in their position. It's always the first line of thought is that um, if someone's mechanically talented enough, this is always the first bar you need to pass in order to be the best in your position. I think where, where T1 fall flat is in their ability to connect with jungle and support to actually make uh, decisive decisions and finding guaranteed leads that don't rely on lane advantages. Uh, owner and Korea's cooperation is quite poor, and I think in a lot of games, Faker needs to fend for himself around mid lane, and I think this is something that um, Faker deserves more credit for, right? In terms of how he fends for himself and how he uh, tries to find impact. I think the main point of criticism for Faker is that um, he's always, not always, but especially this year, he has had a fairly limited effective champion pool in certain circumstances and when teams begin to establish that pattern and he's playing against someone elite like Chovy uh, you can see a clear gap in the mid lane it was also the same against BDD uh, but I want to also underline this with this is a player that was indeed fucking injured right and it's not a question of uh, you have an injury and then boom you go back to play no it's like you you have an injury and you don't play. So there, there is going to be a, a recovery process and a lagging process. Uh, and obviously the intangible effects of Faker can't be understated. But uh, T1 as a team, I think that when it comes to mechanical skill, when it comes to laning, they are brilliant. When it comes to team fighting, that's an extension of that. But everything in between, the beats that they need to hit, that is where T1 can potentially suffer. Uh, if you remember back to T1, uh, the, the the T1 that came into MSI and the, the T1 that eventually uh, lost the finals against Gen G, um, in that regular season, T1 was in this flow state where, of course, Korea was playing all of these ranged AD carries. And uh, in order to pull those off, you need to be mechanically very talented. And we continue to Cloud9 and Mad Lions, the battle of. The two teams, so I didn't predict uh, a T1 wins. <laughs> uh, Cloud9 versus Mad Lions. The battle of the two teams that couldn't improve. Yeah, the battle of the two teams that couldn't improve. Cloud9. Somewhere along in spring, they replaced Diplex with MNS, which made a lot of sense. Uh, Diplex was a player that didn't look too comfortable on stage and was dropping in CS super, super much. C9, uh, they won, plain and simple, uh, even though they played quite poorly and inaccurate. There was always the cheat code uh, that uh, Berserker will carry. Uh, and um, that is something that held true for the longest time up until the point where they lost, of course, against NRG. Uh, in the finals and that is where the music was clearly ringing for them and the truth of Cloud9's improvement was evident. I think that C9 is a clever drafting team but I think that often in terms of what their team identity is I think I cannot describe it better than to say that uh, the main issue for Cloud9 in a lot of cases is that I think the, the lack of humility to uh, sharpen your strongest spear, meaning creating a circumstance where Berserker gets advantages and making yourself, you know, train that one kick 
is something that C9 never really settled for. And I think that if they did, they would have won the LCS, but maybe C9's goals were greater than that. If they were, I don't think it's evident through gameplay. I think that there is a hint of arrogance in the way MNS and Fudge play, because I think that they are trying to achieve a lot in every game, uh, which can be a very, very good trait. But in a lot of cases, when that doesn't play out correctly, as you're trying to achieve more, you can become more of a greater liability. Right? And I think that um, Blabber, still a very, very solid jungler. Sven has expanded a little bit more to play some of the engaged supports, which I think is a form of improvement. I think that uh, the main concern here is that C9 in terms of... It's like C9 in a weird way is like a North American version of what T1 is. And um, I think that uh, while they have some mechanically good players in terms of how they connect and piece it together with jungle and support is where NRG completely bonked them in the finals. Ign Ignar really had Sven's number and uh, I think that C9's, uh, let's say, demons caught up to them. The main question for C9 is like how fruitful has this bootcamp been for them because C9's biggest challenge for a long time was that um, similar to G2, they don't didn't have great opposition to practice against because it definitely took some time for the likes of Team Liquid, Energy uh, and Golden Guardians to actually kick it into gear. So now C9 no longer have that excuse. We'll see if this boot camp where they face against tougher opponents if they've been forced to face the truth of their, uh, you know, flaws already in practice. Because even though G2 has managed to do this very well in Europe, uh, I think that it is still a very challenging thing to do. And on the other side, we have Mad Lions, the poster child of European pain when it comes to international events. Mad Lions uh, went 0-6, and six. even though they lost against two teams that they were clearly not the favorite against, they lost against T1, and they lost against, of course, G2. If um, the 0-6 scoreline, uh, you know, was just that, it's like I expected them to lose against both teams, uh, I think that the main thing that stands in everyone's mind is the 1647. It sounds like a year or something, but 1647... Uh, one of the fastest losses, if not the fastest loss, of a European team at the international stage. This was, you know, people... Like, I wanted to say that there was... Like, in the past, people surrendered games at the world stage. They FF'd and exploded their own nexus. But back then, there was no FF before 15 minutes, so it's like this speedrun will not be beaten. Nevertheless, Mad Lions is a team. I think... Uh, you have two players that are the engines and the catalysts for Mad Lions' peaks. I think that uh, Hilly and Elioya have had very, very up and down performances. And I think that um, in the most recent times, uh, their BO5 against uh, Fnatic, I think that they had a very poor read on the meta. This is also something that plagues them. I think that uh, they like to be in circumstances where everything is quite systematic and they have a very easy tree to branch out from. It's like, oh, if they do this, we do this. If they do this, we do this. And if they don't do any of those two, we will always do this. Right? Uh, like a kind of three-pronged uh, draft, like similar to how Mad Lions did with the Vi and the Gragas and, and the so forth. Because looking back at the series against Fnatic, game one and two, um, those were... Uh, quite massive draft failures. And looking at Mad Lions coming into this tournament, I think the story of them the entire year is that it's very, very tough to set expectations for them. Uh, we hear things out of their camp, and, uh, you know, Mac is also uh, about to be a father, and he is um, absent uh, from uh, the tournament uh, on location, which is completely understandable. You know, congratulations to Mac and his... Uh, it's his beautiful family. I'm very happy for him. I consider him like a, a good friend. And Mad Lions is such a unique team in the sense that we, we, we have no idea how to set expectations. But 
I think that uh, if we look at the positives, I think that Kazi and Niski performed quite well, even in the context of Mad Lions underperforming, which I think is something that can carry over now to at the World Championship. I think that Kazi is a player that I've seen a lot in the top end tracking the pros games and he's doing super, super well. He can play a lot of the champions, uh, especially the Kalista, right? We saw a pentakill from his uh, against Fnatic. The Kalista is going to be massive in such a series. I think that Kazi has a very, very good pool coming into this tournament. Hilly and Lioya are players that have shown that they can compete against the best. And I think that um, that's what Mad Lions fans need to hope out for, that Hilly and Lioya find uh, their cooperation and uh, through that dominate games because mad lions regardless of what, how you view them they've had very high peaks this year and i think that they were the only team that had the capacity to actually upset the g2 uh, besides maybe a fanatic uh, at the end of it all so mad lions they got second place they got first place sucked at msi sucked in summer and did a third place uh, placing of course in uh, the finals so i think mad lions in this particular matchup i'm going to say that mad lions is going to be the better team i have uh, high hopes for hilly and elioya uh, and i think that they should be the favorite coming into this one against c9 i think that uh, the upside of the mad lions players in terms of what they've shown is just higher so i'm going to uh, you know gamble on that Genji versus Gami Esports. Uh, just to define Genji, I think Genji is a team that has incrementally improved while risking and sacrificing nothing of their past self. Usually, in terms of how you view uh, and 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 basically uh, look at performance, usually. This is time, this is performance. Usually, sorry, this is performance. And this is, no, this is time. I was right, sorry. So basically, usually when it comes to a team peaking, right? The team has found a new peak, right? Usually in order to reach a new peak, you have to sacrifice some of the habits that maybe have been fine for you and you need to restructure and then you need to do some sacrifices in order to re be reborn anew with newer habits and newer gameplay patterns and new draft ideas. Like I guess the most black and white way of uh, viewing this, but let's say this is where a new patch hits and you need to, uh, like you could, you could say that, oh, we're going to keep playing uh, let's say uh, this. Let's say we're gonna keep playing the same champions, and then slowly we're going to uh, regress, right? Because uh, let's say that the, the meta shifts. We're gonna, but we decide, yo, we're gonna pick the same champs because that's what we're used to when we have a match day. And maybe in the short term that can be positive, right? But then eventually it will be stagnation, right? But I use this example of of patch, uh, and it, you have to restructure yourself, you have to regroup, you have to rethink, and then you look for, for higher peaks and higher performances through that, right? And usually in this idea of restructuring your gameplay patterns and the champions that you play, uh, you have to put some of the things that you do know and love at risk, right? This is where comfort is considered, right? You reach comfort, you break comfort in order to achieve a higher high. And then usually performances like that, right? It fluctuates. In regards to Genji, I feel like they are the team that has held on so well throughout the year and they've had incremental improvements always. You know, I made that grab before. Um, but I feel like Genji is the team that has been... They started rather high because they just have had great players and pace and delight turned out to be S-tier players, right? And they have just incrementally held on to everything that they know and incrementally improved. I think this is an accurate depiction of their gameplay too. I think that in terms of how they approach the game and how disciplined they are, I think definitely they are the most disciplined team at this World Championship. And the key thing for them, right, I think that the teams that are in a similar tier of gameplay as them, the challenge would be for Genji, how do they manage 
to play against teams that are willing to be more dynamic. I think that Gen G is a team that are very, very disciplined and like to keep everything as systematic as possible. I think a big step of improvement for me was just how Chovy played in the finals because it feels like Chovy is finally growing out his mid lane wings. Chovy has followed a line of incredible mid laners that um, were all really, really fantastic at laning. Chovy a little bit step above because of his insane precision and love for filet mignons. But in the finals, as an example, his Talia play or his Kisante play, you can clearly see that uh, Chovy is beginning to see the bigger picture and at the same time maintaining the deadliest part of himself, which is the mechanics and the lane phase. Most mid laners that are at the S tier level have gone through this change. Caps 2017, 2018 was a lane demon. And then 2019, he turned into the guy who roamed over and over again and saw the bigger picture of the game. He was willing to sacrifice six minions to break the whole game and to find the winning position and the winning play through game vision. 2019, he did exactly this against Showmaker, and then Showmaker coming into 2020 also spread his mid lane wings and began to view the game deeper. And through that, enabled Canyon to have one of the best jungle performances of all time. And Faker was the same. 2013 was a very specific mid lane meta. Everything was revolved around him because at the time it was kind of right to play. So you killed raptors your jungle was your dog and mid laners were incredibly op at the time but with time you also knew that faker started to play with his vision rather than when i say vision i i mean it in the similar way as a iniesta or pirlo has insane game vision right or had because i think both of them retired but you get my point right game vision right i feel like chovy is starting to branch out there you know he's starting to become that player that is ready to win a world championship. And I think this is what makes me extra excited for Genji, even though that they have had a history of falling flat. So Genji as a team, I think that in terms of performing at a solid 90%, you can always assume that they will. Billy Billy, LNG, JDG, you know, the teams that uh, I would rate above Genji, these teams play with some variants, right? They can have 70% games, but they also are capable of having 100% games. And that is where Genji will be challenged. Right? When the games are a lot more dynamic and chaotic, this is where Genji fall flat. And this is where you see Peanut struggle. Or when we saw Genji at MSI, for example, where Chovy needed to play the role of Lissandra and Annie and find engage angles and really, really look terrible at it, right? It wasn't a game of, oh, we are in control and we're going to take incremental leads and we're going to win on our terms. Sometimes in these very dynamic games, it becomes a constant negotiation and fight for uh, power. I hope that makes sense. On the other side, Gigabyte Marines, they qualified here through a very good performance against Team Wales. I'm not going to lie. I didn't know what happened. I think that uh, Kati really, really stepped up. I think Levi has been quite disappointing in my mind. I think that in terms of how he played out the early games has been rather bad. Like the best games from Levi have been on Wukong, which is the epitome of let me get to Divine Sunderer and then I will swing the game. Gigabyte Marines, uh, I will keep calling the Gigabyte Marines. It's just a, such a cool name. They're called GAM, not Gigabyte Marines anymore. Um, they got to this spot by playing it safe, which is fair play, but I don't think that they have shown anything that uh, gives me the idea of upset potential. I think that Gigabyte Marines most likely will not win a single game this entire Swiss stage. I think that they will go 0-4 because their approach to the game was incredibly safe and they won based off of the mistakes that R7 and Lao did, not uh, because Gigabyte Marines uh, did something good or proactive which I think is the death sentence when it comes to playing against teams that are better than you. Team BDS. Team BDS is a team that I think throughout they experience, I think, 
a great challenge, a great amount of stress, because you could clearly see the Team DS, they, they were definitely underperforming at times, and I don't think that uh, Team, BS, Team BS's performance in the planes was, was impressive. Keep in mind that this is supposed to be one of the easiest planes of all time, because there's no Korean team and there's no Chinese team as well, right? And additionally, it's like Team BDS, their best games still were against Golden Guardians. Um, they had uh, some decent moments, of course, against PSG to turn it around. But if we look at the context of the rest of the tournament, it's not super, super exciting. I think that um, BDS did show some signs of life again in the bot lane. I think that Labrov and Crowny, Crowny after he started to expand on his champion pool. Uh, I still think Ezreal is fucking strong, but I don't think Ezreal is a problem like if they want to play Ezreal I like the whole chat is gonna say oh no they're FFing no Ezreal is a decent champ like the Ezreal Ezreal is a good champ and there's definitely like a lot of moments that you need to pick Ezreal I'm telling you that um I think that uh Shio is the one that I am worried about if he's not playing the Zaza boys you know Maokai and Ivan who is he as a player and that is something that worries me I think that Nuclear, you know, it's good that he finds his picks where he's comfortable. I think that he was important in the wins uh, on his Azir and on his um, Casio as well. Uh, I think that's cool and all, but I just don't think it's enough to do damage here. I could see a world where Team BDS uh, take some names uh, against some of the North American teams, but I think against their European brethren, they should be at a disadvantage. And then finally, of course, Adam. When you are a man of unique tricks, then you get to the point where, you know, like, look at David Blaine, right? He's a magician, you know? He's a magician, people say, but he has gotten so famous and so viewed through a light that, you know, he needs to just fuck himself up at this point, you know? He needs to fly in air balloons, he needs to go underwater, he needs to stick ice picks through his hand. Mother of gods, you know? He, he is past the tricks and he needs to get his hands dirty. And I think that's where the point where Adam is at, you know? He has this extra little pistol on his foot, right? And that's what his champion pool is going to be. I think being able to play Garden and Darius and Olaf and Set on Demand is a very powerful tool, but to have that as the main thing in your arsenal makes it easier for teams to prepare against you. But it's one of those things, right? People say, you know, everyone walks into a fight with Deontay Wilder knowing that he has knockout power, and still the majority of fighters that have been in the ring with Deontay Wilder get KO'd. So it is also a question of, you know, Adam is very good when it comes to these things, and I hope that they deploy it fully against JDG. JDG, probably uh, the least flawed team. I think that um, the only concern for JDG is that they've had occasional games where, for example, Knight underperforms, where Kanavi underperforms, uh, and there are they make series close. JDG have dropped the ones against very bad teams, but they have closed out the series right after the fact. And it seems like JDG are always dancing on that edge, and then when it comes down to it and they need to win, they can get a win. Even though JDG haven't lost a single BO5, they went five games against the T1, they went five games against LNG. They constantly smoke Billy Billy like it's nothing, but there are definitely series that have gotten close for JDG. And the question is, right, if there will ever come a time where they have dropped enough games where the perfect performance from the opposition is enough to kill them off. I don't think it's relevant in this matchup against Team BDS, but I think that it's still an interesting topic to explore because I think this is the only kind of flaw that you can point to when it comes to JDG because when they are on... I don't think that anyone comes close in terms of lane precision, in terms of how they team fight together in unison. It is a masterclass in terms of how important missing is and 369 is to set probably the strongest two carries 
that you can have uh, for success and Kanavi being a very important facilitator, being able to play any type of meta. I know that there's some mid laners there that can be considered better than Knight, especially with his summer performance. I'm just putting Ruler and Knight together. If I compare them to, for example, Faker Kumayushi or Trovi Pays, Knight and Ruler, it's just Ruler is a bit broken. Ruler is just currently a perfect play. It's Ruler is the bar, and no one is close in the educated position. Besides maybe Gala, or maybe a future Viper that is cooking and brewing and is getting upset and angry, or a Jackilove. Just a shout out to my homies that didn't make it to the World Championship. G2. G2 Esports. I think a very big thing for G2 after MSI is that they actually managed to improve on the details and ideas that uh, they were lacking in when it came to playing against Korean and Chinese teams. Their Dragon setup, their, man their wave management, in terms of how they move in unison and how they leverage Folk of War, these are things that G2 clearly, clearly have improved on. So their macro is now up to par, and I think that's super, super important. The main question for me when it comes to G2 is, how will they fare in lane? Because I think when it comes to the strategic game, I think that they can compete. In terms of team fighting, we've seen brilliancies from all of these players because I think G2 as a team have great vision, but how will they fare in laning phase? Caps being 69% win ratio, 1000 LP in Challenger. You know, this is very, very exciting. Caps seems to be informed. Caps seems to be hungry. I feel like how G2 uh, have planned their whole year uh, seems to really, really be like a role model for everybody else in terms of how you want to get the most out of things and really, really getting the buy in from the staff and the players. G2 as an organization and their staff and the players have really, really set the bar here. And I hope that uh, teams will follow. I work in the LEC next year that these are similar ideas in terms of what I think are important too. making sure that the buy-in is there, making sure that the team culture is agreed upon by everyone and that the goals are set together. And then each day is set to uphold that. And when you have that buy-in, the conversations about how you want to improve and move forward become so more solidified. And this is the energy I get and feed off of G2 every time. And I'm in a position where I know more about G2 than maybe some of the Eastern teams, but I just wanted to highlight this. I think G2, um, in terms of experience, Mickey, Caps is right there, right? Uh, Yike is a player that doesn't seem to be a rookie to me at all. I think that he is playing phenomenally, right? I think he's a fantastic player. I think that BB showed a lot at MSI and also throughout summer that he was insanely, like, insanely pivotal uh, for G2's success. And then, of course, Han Sama as well. I think he's coming into this World Championship with a fantastic meta. I think the key thing here for G2 is how will Caps fare in the lane phase? How will Broken Blade function in a more um, maybe counter... Uh, prone meta in the top side will we see the bb that was willing to play cassio top and drew bands or uh, will we see uh, the bb that plays the poppy into some of these key champs uh, we could be in a situation where you know Asante and renekton uh, will be traded back and forth and rumble ban, uh, ban perma and i think that bb will do just fine in those cases i think the key thing will be how do these mid 3v3 dynamics play out for for g2 and I think when it comes to mid to late game, I think that they can compete on a macro scale. But the key thing here at the World Championship, what was unique about you in Europe is the standard. So this macro concept being up to par with this, that is just the entry ticket for you to roll uh, with the, the best. Damon. Very exciting team, Showmaker, Canyon, Deft. How can you not get excited about these players? They've had a very, very rough year, very rough year. I think macro-wise, I think that they have struggled super, super hard. It is sad because if Damwon, I feel like if Damwon had Barrel, I think this team would be completely different. And um, they needed, they needed, they need like another player that is willing to sacrifice himself to make sure that the ideas of others connect. And I feel like Deft is the ideal AD carry. 
easy for me to say after they just won the world championship right as uh, as, a, as a duo but um i think it's true that one macro wise is 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 very disconnected i feel like kana and their support often don't know where to be and with that uh, showmaker canyon and have shown clear moments of desperation that make them look quite bad I think Showmaker in the regional uh, playoffs, I think that he turned into an absolute beast. And Canyon at times has looked very, very deflated. Uh, I don't know if it's due to the jungle changes or the circumstance of his team, or just the meta being in a position where Peanut is God and he can't do anything about it. Dama come into this tournament. Now we know that the meta will relatively be the same. I think that Dama will take the approach of trying to murder the Maokais and the Ivans of the world by level 3 and bring them with Javan. I think this is what Damon's approach will be. I think that in terms of early game, I still think Damon can be one of the most dangerous teams at this tournament. Showmaker, Canyon, Deft, in terms of how they've come out of early phases, they have been very, very sharp. This is what makes this matchup so interesting. If G2 manages to neutralize Damon in the early game, I think that G2 win. If Damwon managed to take the game away from an early game explosion, which is something sometimes Yike offers through imprecisions in the early game, then I think that Damwon will uh, take the hand that you offered and pull away your whole arm. In this particular case, though, considering it's BO1, and I think that the jungle meta is in a place where G2 can breathe, I have to lean towards G2. Weibo Gaming FAW Audi versus Energy. So, Weibo Gaming, I think that um, the reason they're here at the World Championship in my mind is uh, Weiwei was put into the roster uh, over Karsa, and I think that he uh, really, really gave a lot of life uh, to, to, to Weibo back again. I think also Zhao Hu has had a fantastic year. The mid laners coming out of LPL are absolutely just brilliant, insane, really, really strong players. And um, I think that um, that is the heart and soul of the team, Jahu. There's been some, you know, the biggest knock on Light is that he isn't the AD carries around him. I think that Light is rather solid, solid player. And uh, he can play a multitude of champions. Uh, but in a world where the AD carries around you are Jackie Love and Ruler and Gala. It is tough to stand out. And I think that he is very serviceable. And I think that when he's playing against the likes of Energy, I think that he will look fantastic. Right? I think that... Um, uh, Deshai is someone that is very worth mentioning too, of course. I think that he is a player. I think I think he's, he fits very similarly to the class of players that Adam is, uh, but um, not with that same unique champion pool. I think that Deshai is a very good player at destroying players that are worse than him. And I think that he's a definition of a squeezer. And sometimes when he does, he becomes straight up a liability but it also brings crazy highlight moments. This is not the shy from 2018, 2019. This is a new version of the shy and there's been clear moments of, even though he's, he's still a squeezer, we've gotten to the point where even in some of those squeezes, it's not only that sometimes they are just bad decisions. Sometimes they're also just mechanical misplays. And I think that's what, makes the shy quite inconsistent but he's a legend of the game one of the goats of top lane for sure open conversation and um, i think in such a matchup against energy is going to be fantastic and weibo has had games where if the shy pops off and performs and everything falls into place weibo has had some top end games in terms of like quality so uh, don't sleep on weibo you know especially in a tournament like this i say don't sleep on weibo after i put them as a team not to qualify, but they definitely have the capacity to maybe make a breakthrough, but odds are probably not. Energy. 
I think that uh, what really, really uh, made them great was the shift in the support meta. The shift in the support meta turned Ignar into Ignar that we know. I think that um, he plays super, super well. I think that the cooperation between contracts and Ignar and how they fight around mid and how they control the game is super good. And I think this was the main reason they won North America. I think that uh, the Hokla and Palafox also really found their peak as uh, players. And I think that they really, really got into comfort. I, I have to say, like the Hokla, I think that um, he had some of the best Rumble loots I've ever seen out of any player. And it seems like the meta just aligned perfectly with the solo laners also peaking. I think FBI is all right. I didn't think that he was vital in terms of uh, winning uh, the matches for NRG. I think that uh, just Ignar, Contract, really, really good uh, jungle super duo, and Palafox and Dihokla really peaking at the right time. So that makes uh, for an interesting team because I think that the meta is very transferable from when they won to now. And I think that uh, as the North American representative, especially after GG uh, disappointed, I think I put them behind in the tier list, but I think that if I looked back at that now, I think that that's wrong. I think that energy is just, uh, I, I have hopes for, for energy. And uh, I think the main thing to pay attention to is just contracts and Ignar. Contracts has won games, done the impossible, he has won games on Nidley. He has uh, won games on a variety of champions and he's uh, very, very flexible. I feel like contracts reminds me a lot of Razork. So if you're a real European fan, I think Contract is basically the, the North American Razork where there were games in the past where he just completely like lost his mind and like kind of stepped into the river when he shouldn't, died and just engaged uh, in a strange way and like played good up until a certain point. And I think Contracts really, really like shed that snake skin off of him, you know, and really, really had a good performance coming all the way into the finals. So I'm very, very happy for Contracts. And um, in this particular matchup, though, I don't think they are going to be the favorites. Uh, they need to see what Ener Weibo have to offer. I'm going to go with uh, the Weibo prediction here. LNG. LNG Esports. You know, why LNG uh, had a such a meteoric rise all the way to uh, the second place and now the third seed of the LPL because uh, Billy Billy qualified through points through their past performances. LNG was a team that was solely driven by the effort and strength of Scout and Tarzan. This was a team that would manage to pick up wins early on in seasons, and then when playoffs came, everyone knew what this team was about. It was all about 2v2 mid and controlling the game through 2v2 mid. And they won a lot of games against really fucking good teams doing so when their teammates just weren't good enough they just weren't good enough and throughout summer the main point of improvement for lng right as you have tarzan and scout holding out their hands waiting for their teammates to grab onto them to make them a fully fledged team this actually occurred the first step was the addition of gala for me the second best ad carry coming into this tournament gala is a mountain of stability and also you know god of kaiser highlight reels you know i think the meta is beautiful for gala and i think that he keeps playing beautiful league of legends and then additionally i think that uh zika the superstar zika is coming to you know he's he's blooming as a player truly he's a player you know if you put 369 in a certain box and you put bin in a certain box zika is the player that a lot of us LPL enjoyers are looking to as the guy who might break the mold and be both. Which is a big ask for a player's first international showing, but Zika does definitely has the potential and has shown that he can swing with the absolute best and uh, play uh, all of the metas in decent form. I think Hung, you know, I think Hung is alright, you know, he was always that dynamic, crazy, highlight hook guy. Uh, but I think just playing with Gala has definitely made the guy better. So a lot of things have fallen into place in LNG and throughout that whole storyline, LNG have kept that crazy strong edge that is their mid 2v2 jungle. Scout's form has been absolutely amazing this year. 
if I look at the amount of games that this guy has single-handedly carried, it is a very, very long list throughout the year. And Scout is a super, super exciting player. And I think that um, LNG is definitely like one of the contenders uh, at this tournament. And I think that LNG is going to smoke Fnatic. But Fnatic as a team, they have very strong mechanical individuals. The only person that I may be concerned about is Noah, because he seems to be a player that needs to get adjusted to pressure before he manages the pressure. And the World Championship, more so than ever, you could be exiting after four games. Airport speedrunners are in shambles because you can be exiting after four games rather than six, right? Sure, you can be out of the tournament after you lost four, 100%, but you always had to stay to play those two final games. And they happened together with the third game, right? Because the way Worlds was structured in the past is that three games were played on the same day because each group had their day eventually, right? Fnatic as a team, I think that mechanically they're very decent. I think that uh, they have players that can swing with the best. Razork, I think Oscarini is good. I think Humanoid too. I think Trimby as well has shown that mechanically he can swing with the best. Noah, I think he has shown high peaks, but I don't feel fully um, fully enough to say that yo Noah is going to do like super super well. He's still, you know, getting adjusted to that pressure. I feel like you know I'm looking back at the Bo5s that they played during the summer finals, and he really really had some really rough games, like pff, terrible games. I think Fnatic. The main concern. And I think the most important thing for them is that I think that they are clever in the way they draft in terms of how they find value from champions. I think the most important thing for Fnatic will be to stabilize. Will they be able to stabilize? I feel like Trimby and Razork don't do well with not having the initiative. And I think that often they accelerate uh, their losses uh, if they are not in the driving seat. And I think this will be the main concern for me is I don't think Fnatic will be able to compete with hitting the right beats against the likes of LNG. But if they have a draft where hitting those beats is not necessary and they can narrow it down to certain item timers, I think that this is where maybe Fnatic can sneak a win. If they are playing lane matchups that are very, very stable and even, I think that this is where Fnatic can make it interesting. But LNG have broken down games with even matchups too. So this will be the main challenge. I think if Fnatic can overcome the hurdle of the early game and really enjoy the fruits of their labor uh, in terms of their draft preparation and their individual skill, I think that Fnatic can uh, potentially upset some teams. But I think it comes down to making sure that that level of stability is there because I think if Trimby and Razork aren't in if they are in a position where they need to react I think that they become inherently worse and they're trying to find ways to get back into the game fast rather than playing with patience and Fnatic need to always make sure that they find alignment in the way they play and I think um, in terms of you know one of the things that you know might be concerning maybe for most is you know Wunder just played and Oscarinin come in I've watched a lot of Oscarinin uh, in or like in solo queue and he seems to be in great form I, I think that he seems to be in great form so super super happy there uh, Fnatic to me is the second best western team at this tournament and maybe through a lucky draw maybe can qualify instead of G2 uh, because that's how a Swiss tournament works finally we have Billy Billy uh, versus KT Rollster this is the battle of the most underrated mid laners on planet Earth. You have Yagao, who is crucial, crucial, crucial. I think that he plays a very important role for the likes of Shun and also for Bin. Because these are players that um, need someone to be the glue. Yagao is the glue. He is willing to make sure that he's there on the timers of his teammates. He is always making sure that he doesn't need any jungle attention to solve his lane states. Uh, always, always is there when you need him. And that might sound easy to your ears, but in terms of managing your lane and managing 
how you find your base timers and your windows to act is what League of Legends is at the highest level, right? And this is something that Yagao does so, so well to enable the likes of Shun and, of course, uh, Bin, because they are very unique players in their own right, right? Shun likes to be the aggressor, and I think that Billy Billy's downfall, not downfall, but the losses again in the BO5s against JDG and then LNG, I think came through um, the, the meta shift. There was no more Wukong, which was a Shun staple. Vi was less. Shun likes to play the brawlers more and the mechanical champions more rather than the Maokai side. And of course, uh, the AD carry meta got a lot worse for Elk. He was the long range uh, killer, right? With the Felios and the Jinx. Uh, but then everything kind of shifted in the direction of uh, the Kaiser and the Zayas. And this is something that uh, I think that Elk didn't manage so well. And this is something that I think that Billy Billy with time will be able to solve. And that's why I'm very hopeful for Billy Billy at this tournament, because I think at the level that they had to play at, at the LPL, I think those meta differences were crucial. And I think that Billy Billy have shown this year that they are able to bounce back very, very fast and adapt and learn from uh, what they've done. The only thing that has been the main blocker is, of course, be beating JDG. Billy Billy still had a fantastic summer record, 16 and 1, only losing to JDG, which is incredible, absolutely incredible. Uh, I think that Billy Billy is a fantastic team, and I think the main thing to pay attention to, of course, is Bin. And if Shun will actually drop his Nidalee or play some of the carry champions that he likes to play. I think On as well is a very exciting player. I think Billy Billy versus KT Rolster is such an exciting matchup because. You have players here that are basically like mirrors of each other in terms of who they are in their own region. Lehens, the wild man who loses his flash randomly level one in a lot of games and picks crazy champs, but manages to sometimes just find so much value in the game. Uh, On is very similar to that, but in my mind, On has a high level of consistency because while Lehens is a wild man and finds peaks sometimes, I think that the floor of Lehens is incredibly low. Uh, and I think that's where On beats him out. More on KT Rolster, I think that Kuz for me is a little bit of a weakness here because I think that in the identity of KT, I think that Kuz got away with playing less champions. He liked Viego, he liked Sejuani, and I think that uh, eventually when those champions were out, Kuz looked as a very, very limited player. I think Korea altogether has had some quite... Uh, they've, they've had some, um, let's say bad performing junglers. I think the junglers coming out of the LCK are not super interesting to me, uh, besides Canyon for who he is and Peanut for his performance. But Cuz and um, Owner, mm, not so certain there. BDD, I think, is the big man for this team. Uh, like, he almost carried the BO5 against T1, T1 twice. He solo killed Faker in multiple of the games. I think BDD has had an incredible year and somehow is in form where he's peaking. He's literally peaking this year. And I think that um, BDD is definitely like a mid laner to look out for. I think he's the second best mid laner coming out, coming out of Korea. And I still say to this day, I'm so sad that we didn't get to see a BDD Chovy BO5 because I think that would have been absolute fire keen in the top side as well he is someone that in the regular split was the guy who was willing to play the fringe counters you know you pull up lolalytics and you say oh renekton's countered by quinn wow in pro play people are very timid they don't want to break through and also winning games with these unique champs is a very different dynamic that you need to adjust your whole team to it's not only about a player playing a specific champ but keen was willing to do so he won games on the Quinn, and he was willing to play the, the fringe counter picks, and that's what made Keen very, very interesting. Then in the matchup against Zeus, I think that he fell flat, but I think that can be said for KT as a whole. Aiming, I think, as a carry, you know, fantastic Zeri player. I think that um, mechanically, super, super good, super solid. I think that aiming reminds me a lot of who Light is, you know? I think that he's very, very solid, very consistent in his output, and is capable of swing and, and like staying relevant with the best uh, but doesn't have quite the flash and the pizzazz of a ruler or a gala but uh, this is the moment for aiming to break through his second 
World Championship performance. So, Billy Billy versus KT Rollster. I have to say that I favor Billy Billy for this one. I think that they are just um, the stronger team. But this is definitely a very close matchup and it's a BO1, so things can get very, very interesting. I think um, in a world where, let's say, the go to blind pick for everybody is Kesanta, this might just be the world where Bin is going to rule. He has the Gwen, the Jax, the Camille, and he carries games better than anybody else. So, uh, through, through top, of course. And. That is exciting itself. But that's my rundown. Uh, I hope you liked the predictions. I hope you liked the, the pickems. I'm just going to leave it on the screen here. Swiss pickem. Wait, it didn't save? It didn't save. Well, we remember very easily what we chose, so... Continue. Wait. Choose one team to go undefeated. Wait. I don't know. Thank God I clicked this. Choose one team to go undefeated. JDG. Or should I drop a Genji? This is a question of draw, but fuck it. It's JDG. Alright. Two. Catch you guys on the flippity flop. All the best. And uh, I'll be streaming later, so take care of yourselves. Bye bye.